Growing up in the 1990s, I was a huge fan of the Orlando Magic. My mom's side of the family is from Louisiana. I grew up watching Shaq in the early 90s when he was playing at LSU. So when the Orlando Magic drafted him in 1992, I followed him to the NBA, became a fan of the Magic. It was really my first exposure to NBA basketball at that point in my life. After the Shaq and Penny Hardaway era in Orlando, the Magic kind of went into a free fall. They had a good year or two with Tracy McGrady, but never got back to the level they were when Shaquille O'Neal was in town. In 2004, all of that changed. When Orlando drafted Dwight Howard with the number one overall pick, it revived a dying franchise. It was a second chance for the city because they fucked everything up the first go around with Shaq. All people remember is Shaq leaving the Magic for the Lakers, but that is just the consequence for how the franchise, and more specifically, the fans and the media, treated their superstar whenever he was in town. People tend to forget, in the summer of 1996, when Shaq was up for his contract extension, the Orlando Sentinel ran a poll. The question was, is Shaquille O'Neal worth $115 million over the next seven years? 91% of the respondents answered no. That, along with Magic Management lowballing Shaq on their initial offer, is what pushed him to Los Angeles. As a small market team in the NBA, you cannot make those kind of mistakes with superstar players. But the arrival of Dwight Howard gave the Magic and the city of Orlando a second chance. A chance to learn from their past mistakes. Treat a superstar player like a superstar player is supposed to be treated. And to their credit, they did a great job. The rise of Dwight Howard in Orlando was kind of meteoric. He and LeBron James were the two young superstar players that were taking over the NBA. In the 2007 NBA general manager survey, General managers were asked which NBA player they would like to build their franchise around. LeBron James, obviously, was first. Dwight Howard was second, ahead of Kobe Bryant, Tim Duncan, two guys, legendary players in their primes. He averaged a double-double his rookie year at 19 years old. His first three years in the NBA, the Magic only made the playoffs once. It was head coach Brian Hill's last season in 2006 and 2007. And Orlando was swept by Detroit in the first round. Enter Stan Van Gundy. Coming fresh off the heels of being screwed over by Pat Riley in Miami. He was the perfect coach for a young, humble, developing Dwight Howard. He devised a system built specifically for his dominant center. It was Really simple. Surround Dwight Howard with three-point shooters and work the offense inside out. Force the ball into the paint to Dwight Howard. He either dominates his defender and dunks or he draws a double team allowing an elite or a good three-point shooter to be wide open on the perimeter. The system worked to perfection. People like to criticize Stan Van Gundy and some of his coaching methods. He's the master of panic. He's always screaming, always up Dwight Howard's ass, never happy. You can criticize Stan Van Gundy all you want, but that is exactly what Dwight Howard needed. Van Gundy knew that he had to stay on his young center, that if he didn't, Dwight Howard would get distracted. He wouldn't work as hard. He knew Howard was not a self-starter. He was not a self-motivator. So as the head coach, he knew that he had to be the guy to relentlessly stay on top of him. And it worked. Orlando made it back to the NBA Finals for the first time since the 1994-95 season. Honestly, 
If Courtney Lee doesn't miss the game-winning layup of Game 2 in the finals against the Lakers, the Magic, I feel, had a great chance of winning that series. That would have taken the series back to Orlando tied 1-1 with three straight home games. But that missed layup took the wind out of the sails of the Magic, and they ended up losing the finals 4-1 to the Lakers. The Magic at that time had the perfect roster for Dwight Howard. That 2008-2009 season was unbelievable. But after that loss in the finals, general manager Otis Smith began a series of questionable decisions. Actually, they were just outright stupid decisions. He let point forward Hito Turgaloo go in a sign-and-trade deal. Turgaloo was critical to Orlando's success. Then Otis Smith brings in a past-his-prime Vince Carter to be Dwight Howard's number two guy. Trades Rafer Austin to the Nets along with Courtney Lee. Rafer Austin, by the way, I think if Stan Van Gundy would have continued to let him start instead of Jameer Nelson in the finals, that the Magic could have won that series. Jameer Nelson went out that year around the All-Star break with an injury, ended up missing the last half of the season and the first two or three rounds of the playoffs. He comes back for that NBA Finals, and Rafer Austin has the Magic in rhythm. Stan Van Gundy inserts Jameer Nelson, and everything was off kilter. So Rafer Alston was an important piece to that team. The 2009-10 Orlando Magic were a completely different team. But they still had success. Lost in the Eastern Conference Finals to the Celtics. Wasn't a bad year. Wasn't as great as the year before. In 2010, the dissension between Dwight Howard and Stan Van Gundy started to surface. It was subtle at first, an argument here, an argument there, but you could tell that Dwight Howard was starting to become visibly frustrated with Stan Van Gundy's methods. He's always negative, always yelling at me. Like I said earlier, Stan Van Gundy's coaching style was what made Dwight Howard successful in the first place. His methods worked when Howard was that humble kid coming out of Atlanta who was preaching about Jesus in the locker room. But after all the individual accolades, the Defensive Player of the Year awards, number one fan vote in the All-Star game, all the success, NBA Finals appearance, Dwight Howard began to think that he was bigger than Orlando. Who could forget his performances in the slam dunk contest in 07 and 08? After that, This guy was no longer Dwight Howard from a small Christian high school in Atlanta, Georgia. He was Superman, a national phenomenon, an international superstar, endorsement deals, commercials. Dwight Howard's face was all over the place. He was like the Baker Mayfield of the NBA. So the yelling coach that was always up his ass went from something that was annoying to something that Dwight Howard could no longer deal with. Fast forward to December 2011. The NBA was returning in January after the lockout between the players and the owners. Before the season begins, news is released that Dwight Howard is demanding to be traded. The three teams that he told Magic Management that he wanted to be traded to were the Lakers, the Brooklyn Nets, or the Dallas Mavericks. And the Dwight Mayer season of 2012 was officially underway in Orlando. One day, Dwight Howard saying that he wants to win a championship in Orlando, that he loves the city, wants to end his career there. The next day, he's wanting to be traded to a championship contender. It didn't make any fucking sense. It was a constant distraction all season that impacted the magic on the court. As they went from being one of the top teams in the Eastern Conference the last couple of years to being the number six seed. But Dwight Howard's trade request and impending departure wasn't the only distraction that the Magic had to deal with. Rumors began to swirl that Howard went to management and demanded that his coach, Stan Van Gundy, be fired. That if Orlando wanted to keep him, they had to get rid of Stan Van Gundy. In April, the Magic are having a shoot-around a few hours before their game against the New York Knicks. Stan Van Gundy's talking to the press. And the inevitable question comes up about Dwight Howard wanting him to be pushed out as coach of the Magic. What transpired next 
was the most awkward press conference, arguably in the history of the NBA. Well, you know what, to me, and I mean, look, since everything came out yesterday, you know, I'll be honest, you know, you, you know you're gonna get asked and you think about how you're gonna respond and, you know, and the whole thing. And I, the, the only thing I'm ever uncomfortable with is bullshit, you know, and so, to come in and no comment or deny that it's true and everything. I mean, the only thing I guess, David, that ever liberates me is just, you know, be honest and deal with what's out there. I, some people have a hard time with that, I guess, but uh, to me, that's a lot easier to deal with than bullshit. What is your sense about when you talk to management? Will they listen to him or will it be a management Oh, decision? I have no idea. They can, well, obviously it'll be a management decision. They have to make the decision. but. But I ain't worried about that. So. Yeah, Stan, we're not worried about that, right? That's what I just said. We got to be worried about winning games. Yeah, what's our main concern right now? Jameer. We have to uh, stop Carmelo Anthony and the New York Knicks tonight. And the New York Knicks. That's exactly That's right. the plan, right? That is the plan. That's what yeah. I just said. Is Dave Ping here today? The guy who started his BS? He's. I don't see Ping here. Me but, neither. Uh, are you guys done with uh, me? Yeah. Let's all get to him now. All right. Dwight, are the stories uh, true uh, about? Come on, man. Yeah, the, the stories from Dave Ping are true. Stan just said they were true. Yeah. What was true? Stan just said that you wanted him fired. I said that. Yeah, that's what Stan said. Who did I say that to? According to Mister. I don't know. I'm just telling you. I'm, I'm asking you. Because you guys got so many sources. Uh, your, your, your coach said he heard it from me. I didn't hear anything. I'm just telling you. And I'm just telling you. It doesn't get much weirder than that. I mean, you can't make this shit up. At this point, fans of the Orlando Magic were just wanting the Dwight Mayer season to end. The team was discombobulated. There was no chemistry. It was a miserable year. Dwight Howard had hijacked the entire season and made it all about himself. And as a result, the team suffered for it. Oddly enough, a week or two after that awkward press conference with Stan Van Gundy, Dwight Howard's season would end due to a back injury that forever changed his career. We'll get to that in a second. Shortly after the Magic were bounced in the first round of the playoffs, Dwight Howard got what he wanted. Stan Van Gundy was fired, but it was not enough to keep him on Orlando as he announced that he wanted to be traded anyway. Thanks for firing Stan Van Gundy, but I'm getting the hell out of here. In the summer of 2012, Dwight Howard finally got his wish. He would finally be happy. He was traded to the Los Angeles Lakers in a four-team deal. After a disastrous season in Orlando where he absolutely ruined his public image. He went from being one of the favorite players in the league to being public enemy number one in the matter of about five months. He was finally off to Los Angeles for a fresh start to revitalize his career. And the Lakers were expected to be a contender. You had what was supposed to be a three-headed monster in Kobe Bryant, Steve Nash, and Dwight Howard. Two of the best guards to ever play the game with a dominant big man in the paint. What the hell could go wrong? Everything. It started almost immediately as the Lakers opened the season 1-4 and four and Coach Mike Brown was fired. By the time Mike D'Antoni was hired, Dwight Howard was playing for his fourth head coach in less than a year. After a New Year's Day loss to Philadelphia in January 2013, reports began to surface that there was tension between Dwight Howard and Kobe Bryant. The two nearly got into a fight after the game with Kobe agreeing with Shaq's assessment that Dwight Howard was soft as fuck. Later that month, Dwight Howard began to express his displeasure to the media. He was complaining about his lack of touches, not getting off enough shots. Rumors began to surface that now he was wanting out of Los Angeles. I mean, the guy even had problems with Steve Nash in LA. One of the easiest players in the league to get along with. With Dwight Howard going public with his complaints, Kobe Bryant decided that he was going to go public as well. After Howard missed three straight games due to a shoulder injury, Kobe Bryant criticized him to the media for not being able to play through pain. 
He told the media that the team doesn't really have fucking time for Dwight Howard's shoulder to heal itself. And he needs a sense of urgency from Dwight Howard. Lakers coach Mike D'Antoni echoed those same sentiments, stating that Dwight Howard had been cleared to play for a while and was basically sitting out on his own. So after the Lakers win three straight in Dwight Howard's absence, he returns due to the pressure from Kobe Bryant and Mike D'Antoni and has one of the worst games of his career to that point in a 21-point loss to the Celtics. After this poor performance, in true Dwight Howard fashion, he cries to the media that his team's not supporting him and hopefully they'll start supporting him the way they need to support him. Whatever the fuck that means. The bickering between Dwight Howard, Kobe Bryant, and Mike D'Antoni continued publicly over the next couple of months to end the season. And as a result, the Lakers are absolutely sucking and barely hanging on for the playoffs. But the end of the season, things seem like they're starting to come together a little bit. The Lakers win eight of their last ten games with Dwight Howard averaging 21 points a game. However... Kobe Bryant goes down with an Achilles injury 10 days before the playoffs and obviously lost for the season. Have no fear, though. The Lakers have another superstar in Dwight Howard, right? He led the Magic through several deep playoff runs. He can do the same in Los Angeles, right? I mean, we're talking about a superstar caliber player here. Wrong. The 2013 playoffs for the Lakers, much like the entire regular season, was an unmitigated disaster. They were swept by the Spurs, with Dwight Howard getting ejected in the third quarter of Game 4. So Dwight Mayer 2.0 was officially over in Los Angeles, with Dwight Howard hitting free agency in the summer of 2013. He enters free agency, and no one knows what the hell he's going to do. He can't make up his fucking mind. He has made a career at this point of waffling back and forth when making a big decision. He informs the Hawks, the Mavs, and the Warriors that he's not going to sign with them. It's either going to be the Rockets or the Lakers. But he can't make a decision. Just like in Orlando, one day he's going to Houston. The next day, he wants to stay in Los Angeles. The extra $30 million he would receive by signing with the Lakers is hard to turn down. I mean, understandably so. But ultimately, Dwight Howard decides that he would rather be happy than be rich. So he decides to join James Harden and sign with the Rockets. Foregoes that additional $30 million he would have gotten for the Lakers. Which wasn't all that surprising, seeing as how his one year in Los Angeles was a disaster and he couldn't stand playing with Kobe Bryant. I think the management in Los Angeles actually wanted Dwight Howard back because they knew Kobe was coming off of an Achilles injury and at 35 years old, he would likely never be the same player. He was in his prime. The Lakers needed a superstar to build around for their future and they wanted Dwight Howard to be that guy. Honestly, him leaving Los Angeles though was the best thing that could have ever happened to the Lakers. So Dwight Howard arrives in Houston for yet another fresh start. Another chance to revitalize his career. Reclaim the glory that he had in Orlando. He had a dynamic point guard, James Harden. And honestly, the first season in Houston went pretty good. Even though the Rockets were eliminated in the first round of the playoffs, Dwight Howard was happy his first year in Houston. His second season with the Rockets was plagued by injuries. He only played in 41 games. But he did end up getting healthy for the playoffs, helped Houston reach the Western Conference Finals where they eventually lost to Golden State. But, just like in Orlando, just like in Los Angeles, you knew things couldn't stay quiet for long. Dwight Howard is happy when he is a focal point of the offense, when he gets the opportunity to be a star. When that gets taken away, when, when the spotlight gets taken off of him and put on someone else, he becomes miserable and it affects the entire locker room. Just like in Los Angeles when he was complaining about his lack of touches, the same thing happened in his third season with Houston. 
After the Rockets got off to a slow start in the 2015-16 season, reports started to surface that Dwight Howard was unhappy. Again, he wasn't happy about playing second fiddle to James Harden. Wasn't happy with his role in the offense. Through the first 26 games of the 2015-16 season, Dwight Howard was averaging only eight shots a game. He was getting less touches than guys like Trevor Ariza, Marcus Thornton, Terrence Jones. Once again, Dwight Howard's ego got in his way. He could not get used to the fact that he wasn't the man anymore. Kobe Bryant was the man in Los Angeles. James Harden was the man in Houston. Everybody knew it except Dwight Howard. He also knew that the Rockets had an emerging star on the bench in Clint Capella that could step in and do everything that Dwight Howard did and do it better. Not to mention the fact that he was younger. With the rash of injuries that he had went through the previous four years, Dwight Howard was no longer the superstar talent that he used to be. As a result, the 2015-16 season was the worst season statistically since his rookie year. Once again, the Rockets got bounced in the first round of the playoffs. The second time that had happened in three years with Dwight Howard. He opted out of the final year of his contract and hit free agency. Again. Initial reports were that Houston wanted him back. I don't know why, but initial reports were that Rockets management wanted him back. But once they hired Mike D'Antoni in June of that year to be the head coach, the writing was all but on the wall for Dwight Howard. He was fucking gone. He wasn't coming back to Houston. Not with the history that he and Mike D'Antoni had from their time in Los Angeles. So once again, Dwight Howard was back on the market. When all was said and done, he decided to go home to Atlanta and join the hometown Hawks. He viewed it as the equivalent of LeBron James going back home to Cleveland to win a title. He was going to do the same thing for the Hawks in Atlanta. The only problem was... Dwight Howard wasn't LeBron James, and he was the only one that didn't realize that. He still thought he was 2009 Dwight Howard. He fucking wasn't. Within a couple of months of being in Atlanta, Dwight Howard had already worn out his welcome in his own hometown. Players in Atlanta eventually grew tired of Dwight Howard giving these pregame pep talks, talking about coming together as a unit, going out there and winning, and then going out on the court, and he gives absolutely no effort. The Hawks were bounced in the first round of the playoffs, and shortly after, Dwight Howard was on his way out of Atlanta via the trade. When Hawks players found out about the trade, they were furious. Actually, it was the exact opposite. Players in Atlanta actually celebrated the departure of Dwight Howard. There were even reports of parties celebrating him leaving the Hawks. Dennis Schroeder, known around the NBA as a great teammate, came out and said that Dwight Howard only played hard in about four games a year when he was playing against his former teams. Basically, just like in LA, just like in Houston, Dwight Howard was a locker room cancer. He was becoming the Terrell Owens of the NBA, except not putting up numbers that Terrell Owens did. I'm not going to sit here and go over Dwight Howard's time in Charlotte and Washington because, to be honest with you, it's just the same story as it was in Houston, Los Angeles, and Atlanta. Dwight Howard wearing out his welcome with his corny jokes, with not taking the game seriously, and just outright being an ass. So, what is the reason for Dwight Howard's drastic decline in the NBA? Well... Part of the reason is, I think, Stan Van Gundy shaded a lot of his weaknesses. He built a system and a roster that played to Dwight Howard's strengths. He made him the focal point of the offense, and he played to his ego a little bit. Another reason for Dwight Howard's decline is his own ego. He should have never left Orlando. The biggest mistake that he has ever made in his career was leaving the Orlando Magic, and he even admitted to this a couple of years ago. But once he became a superstar, in his mind, he became too big for the city. He thought he was a big fish in a small pond. 
too big for his head coach. He wanted to play alongside other superstar players in the league. And they didn't have that at the time in Orlando. Rashard Lewis wasn't a superstar player. Jameer Nelson wasn't a superstar player. Dwight Howard wanted to join the big dogs. He just couldn't hang with the big dogs was the only problem. And when you're playing alongside guys like Kobe Bryant or James Harden, they are not going to handle you with kid gloves like Dwight Howard was handled in Orlando. The media in Los Angeles wasn't going to be easy on him like the media in Orlando was. In Orlando, they were just happy to have him. In Los Angeles, you've got to live up to the legacies of other big men that came before you. Shaquille, Kareem. You've got to live up to that. Dwight Howard couldn't do it. Once that pressure began to build on him in Los Angeles, he started to implode. He could not handle it mentally. Another reason for his decline is the back injury that he suffered late in the 2012 season. He was never the same player after that injury. He didn't have the same speed. He didn't have the same burst in the post. Wasn't the same dominant defensive player that we were accustomed to see. Even if he had stayed in Orlando after that 2012 season, I don't think he would have ever been the player that he was in 08 and 09 and 2010. That back injury was debilitating to him. For a big man, that is a hard injury to get over. But I think the biggest reason for Dwight Howard's decline is simple. The NBA just simply passed him by. The very system he excelled in under Stan Van Gundy ushered in a new wave of NBA players that focused pretty much solely on three-point shooting. The Golden State Warriors took a variation of Van Gundy's system and perfected it. Teams began to play small ball more often. Suddenly, every player on the floor was expected to be a proficient three-point shooter. The fact of the matter is, Dwight Howard didn't change with the times. He never developed an outside shot. The fucker couldn't make a free throw. Once the game moved away from playing in the post, playing in the paint, and his defense wasn't as dominant due to the slew of injuries, Dwight Howard went from a superstar NBA player, one of the most popular players in the league, to a journeyman. All right, that's all for today. Make sure to hit that like and subscribe button for me. Click that notification bell to receive all notifications from the channel. Appreciate those of you that have already done so. Leave me a comment in the section below. Let me know what you think about the rise and fall of Dwight Howard. Give me your reason for the decline of his career. You can follow me on Twitter at KC underscore BTL84. If you have any questions, you can email me at BTLKC84 at gmail.com. I will see you guys next time.